Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Andrea Lipomi, a fellow licensed massage therapist in the fine state of Nevada. But wait, she's also a licensed esthetician and a licensed nail technician. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nick. I'm happy to be here. Oh, this is that's awesome. So yeah, it sounds like you've got a lot going on. Your business is called Fetish Spa Parlor. And tell us what you do there, because that's diff that's separate from your massage therapy career. Correct. So I've had my little um day spa slash curiosity shop slash Victorian parlor uh, in operation since 2013 here in Las Vegas. And I specialize in custom pedicures and skincare there. And then I also do uh, mobile massage therapy and special event chair and table massage therapy as well. Cool. And is it just you at at that? fetish? Yes, it is. I have, um, I have a couple extra rooms that I rent up out to other spa professionals, oh, but fetish itself is just me. So when someone books a fetish appointment, they know they're going to get me. Cool. Okay. So before we talk about Nevada, tell me a little origin story. Give me the, the, how you came to massage therapy. You got it. So I am originally from Rochester, New York, which uh, is closer to Canada than it is to New York city. Hence the accent. Um, I went to massage school, massage school there at the Onondaga School of Therapeutic Massage in 2005 with the ultimate goal of eventually moving to Las Vegas and working as a massage therapist in a resort spa here. So in 2007, I moved to Las Vegas. I had my first, uh, got my first massage job here at the spa at the Rio. And then I opened the spa at the M Resort in 2009 as a massage therapist. And um, uh, in 2008, got my aesthetics license. In 2014, got my nail tech license. And here I am. What's it like being a massage therapist in that Las Vegas scene, working for those big sort of iconic spas and, and, and the like? It is really interesting. It's probably unlike any other employment situation anywhere. Um, you are, you could be in a small spa. Some of the resorts have really cute boutique spas. And then some of them have these massive juggernauts where you might be one of a hundred massage therapists working there. Wow. It's really, yeah, it's, it's something. It's cool because we see tourists here from all over the planet. So yeah. you meet some really interesting people and it's great when um, you establish a relationship with someone and you work at a certain resort long enough where they become a repeat client as well. Yeah, well that's really say, cool. I was, I was going to imagine that you sort of miss out on the therapeutic relationship because the transient nature of the visitors that you don't get it as often, but maybe that's not true. You know, it's it's interesting. It's a little bit of both. Some people might come to Vegas once every 10 years, and some people may come quarterly. So um, I, I've been lucky in that I've made a lot of close uh, relationships with a lot of my repeat out-of-town clients. It's been fun. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's different. What about the scheduling of those spas? Are they like, are they like let's get people going, or do they give you time in between? Is it like grueling it's, like that? You know, that's one of the main reasons why I left the resort spa industry was because it is very much, I'm going to say assembly line, and I don't mean any disrespect to any massage therapist or anyone in spa management. It's just the way the industry is. Well, you it's know, a business you, model. The same thing is true of the chains. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing. Um, you've got your, usually it's 10 minutes between appointments. Um, right. Which means that their hour only has 50 minutes in it. And correct. That, whole, and that whole practice drives me nuts. I know. I like <laughs> I that I can it, give you know, people but, their full time now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I sort of, I, I like as a pushback, I sort of inject that into my marketing where I'm like, you know, an hour here has 60 minutes in it, you know, like. Yeah, that's wise, wise and valid. And um, definitely, I think your clients, I assume your clients really appreciate that. Yeah, well, they seem to back when I was allowed to have them, but that we'll get to that. later. So, so that was the getting into massage therapy then. And then when did you do the esthetician work and the nail technician work? 
Sure. So in 2008, when I got my aesthetics license, a big trend at that time at the Las Vegas resort spas where they were really into hiring um, dual licensed therapists. Mm. So yes, it was a big thing then. And 2008, granted, that's when the market crashed as well, yeah. which is a whole, we could probably talk for 15 minutes about that as a separate thing. But um, 2007, 2008, Vegas was still seeing a lot of growth in the resort corridor. A lot of new resorts opening. Um, like I said, I opened the spot, the M Resort in 2009. And they were just, everything was getting really um, fancy and elaborate and spa menus were turning into these like 16 page Bibles on anything you could possibly imagine that had to do with a, a body wrap and a scrub and a facial and a massage oh. all combined together. And that, ra so, that raises my anxiety. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> and some of, some of the higher end resort spas here still have really elaborate menus and a lot of um fancier treatments like that yeah but you know as time goes on you see some things work and some things don't because resort mm -hmm. spas they they have to uh engage in a lot of trial and error just like we do well and they probably have to ride trends too right i, I imagine they have a lot more cbd offerings now than they did a year ago Exactly. Yeah. You're exactly right. So dual licensed was a thing. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little, you know, bored. I could use some new skills in my toolbox. So I uh, went to school for aesthetics, knowing that I would be more marketable mm. as a Vegas massage therapist if I had my aesthetics license too. And it, and I'm glad I went to school for that. It's, it's been really beneficial. Um, it has given me more at, because at the time that I, I did go to to a stag school and get my license, I was still employed with one of the resort spas here and they were using me for both uh, aesthetics and mm -hmm. massage therapy. So my book, some, you know, some days my book would be pretty much full when some of my coworkers were sitting there bored. So right. yeah. that was, that was useful. And I'm going to say too, with, with the pedicure thing, the nail tech thing, um, I had open fetish and I was planning on doing basically like aesthetics work body treatment wise and focusing on skincare for the feet. And people were like, well, can't you just paint my toes? And I was like, I need a license for that. So that's what led me to go to school for nail technology. And again, I'm really glad I did. I feel like I'm a product of me going to school for three separate related fields. Yeah. And I just, you know, for me personally, it's, it's been great because I can draw on all of those skills. In the spa industry, you're a triple threat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many of you. That's amazing. Thank you. Okay, so if I if I may jump over to what it takes to become a massage therapist in Nevada. Yes. So I wanted to make sure I had some up to date stats for you. So yeah, I um, appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I went online last night and I confirmed that um, massage therapists in Nevada need to have at least 550 hours of training at, of course, a state approved massage school. Um, our state massage board also oversees reflexology and structural integration. And those requirements are a little bit different, but they, they added those things to their uh, board responsibilities in 2018. Okay. Side note. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and let's see. We, they, we used to have to pay every year to renew our license, and a lot. In uh, Nevada, might have, might still have the most expensive massage therapy license in the United States. Tell me if I'm wrong. We used to have to pay 150 dollars for a one year renewal, and now we pay 295 dollars for a two year renewal. What? Uh... Well, doesn't that what? Wait, one fifty for one year, three hundred essentially for two years. Isn't that essentially the yeah. same? Yeah, yeah. They they changed it. I don't know if they were like, "Hey guys, five dollars off for two oh, years." Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah. um, yeah. So now it's set up where you get a two two year renewal for two hundred and ninety five dollars, okay. which always seemed kind of expensive to me because I was originally licensed in New York State. And it was less expensive there. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I have not been asking that question, so I, I don't have a good frame of reference. I, I kind of threw that yeah. out there. I didn't. Yeah, no, I that's didn't great. That's really interesting. <laughs> I, I might start asking that now. Um, um, and so, do, do you does does one take the MBLEX to become licensed in Nevada? 
That is the one thing that I did not look up. I am assuming so. Yeah, I think well, well, more than half of the states are MBLEX, but I'll I'll make a special note of it in the in the notes when I post this. Perfect. And then what about maintaining your license? So we we know the cost, but what about the any CE requirement? Yeah, so every two years you need to have twenty four hours of continuing education, mm-hmm. and Nevada's pretty um, pretty chill about that. You can do it all online, and or you know they don't have and a specific. None, none of it they, has to be in person. No, it can all be online. They don't have a specific ethics requirement or anything like that. Does it have to be like officially approved by a certain state board or any national licensing class board? Well, they automatically uh, approve continuing education from, for example, NCBTMB. But if you took a course, you could even take a college course that if it's somehow related to massage therapy, you can submit that and they'll usually approve that as well. In Oregon my understanding, I hope I didn't do it wrong, but I could actually just like do home study and like listen to a podcast, for example, about, you know, has to be obviously related to the field and just take notes on what I learned. And and that actually counts. Cool. But there is also a, an in-person, like some certain number of your hours here have to be live, you know, in in person. Oh, gotcha. Like hands-on or whatever. Yeah. Hands-on. It's true. Okay. So that's becoming a therapist in Nevada. Interesting. Great. Um, so as we, as we speak, obviously the, the world is going through a, a collective trauma, a crisis. So what is the state of your state? How, how, did it, how did it come to decide to shut down or is it officially shut down? All, all, the, all the facts about where you're at. Sure. Uh, Nevada is officially shut down as we speak right now. Our governor did do a press conference yesterday, April 30th, when our stay-at-home order was set to expire, and he extended it until May 15th. Um, He does leave room for extending it past May 15th if he needs to, or Mm -hmm. ending it early, but I doubt that's going to happen. So we were shut down in mid-March, I want to say March 15th, and that was all non-essential businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously that meant Fetish wasn't going to be open. So (laughs) So like all of you, I have uh, been essentially unemployed since mid-March. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, how have you been occupying your time? Glad you asked. Yeah. (laughs) I have been, in addition to doing little household projects that I had been putting off for way too long, I just took an online um, instructor training for trauma recovery yoga, which is an amazing thing. Um, So yoga too, you're going to be a quadruple threat. I know, right? So like I, so I'm now certified to teach trauma recovery yoga, not like all yoga because that's a 200 hour training thing. And this was a 20 hour workshop, but trauma recovery yoga is where my interest lies. Yeah. Um, so I did that, and it's try for short. So if any of your listeners are interested, they can Google that. Yeah. And uh, I am taking, I enrolled in a course that's actually going to be held the first weekend in June that is um, to become a grief recovery coach. So I'm oh, those getting some things more... sound like they'll be very useful when we get out of this. Thank you. That's what I'm thinking, and it's they've been things I've been interested in learning more about for a really, really yeah. long time. So it, this has given me opportunities to explore other things. So what does the trauma recovery yoga look like? So That's different from what I might see as regular yoga. What are we talking about? Right. So it really, it's the science-based approach that delves into the psychology of trauma. So the, the simplified, um, the idea is there are, there's a set, protocol. There's a chair series and there's a floor series that you do on a mat and the lights are turned up all the way. There's no music. Um, there's no incense burning. It's, and that's so that nothing triggers anyone who has Mm -hmm. undergone really any sort of trauma. Um, there's a lot of affirmations in it. There's a lot of, I am strong, I am secure, I mm-hmm. am, you know, and it's, and it's your yoga, your way. So there's no pressure. There's no handstands or headstands in it. There's mm-hmm. nothing super advanced in it, but everything 
is designed to be easily modifiable so that, you know, I might be up front in the front of the class or on a Zoom um, demonstrating and, you know, giving the vocal, the audit, you know, auditory cues to walk someone through the sequence, but I'm doing my yoga my way and it's all about reclaiming your power. So if you're on the other end of things, kind of following along with me, you're doing your yoga your way. I'm not, I'm not there to criticize or push or, you know, force you to do exactly what I'm doing. Even, the idea is even if you're sitting in the room or li- listening to the Zoom, um, breathing, just sharing space and breathing, yeah. you're still doing yoga. And is the intention to be one-on-one? Um, it can it be either way. It can oh, be okay. either way. Yeah. Um, classes are popular too, but that's another reason why having the lights, you know, up at full brightness and um, not having the music or anything triggering and, yeah. and, you know, being aware of where, for instance, the door is, you don't want to have your, the people in your class, you don't want their backs to the door. Like my back would be to the door. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like you've you've been pretty proactive, educating yourself and getting ready for 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 new avenues when when we can get back to it. Are you like if if your order released on the fifteenth, would you jump back in? Are you do you feel good with that? What's your feeling about getting back to it? Uh, my feeling right now, knowing what we know now, my feeling is the 15th is a little early for me and what I do. You know, I'm in an enclosed space with my client for, I don't do short pedicures. So I'm with people for on average two hours per appointment, Mm -hmm. you know, in a smallish enclosed room, which on one hand is, I think, a benefit going forward because it's not a crowded space with people coming and going, Right. you know, for two hours. Yeah. Right. Um, but two, I, you know, I, I actually closed fetish a couple days before our governor came out with the stay at home order because I felt like that was the ethical responsible thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not looking to jump into anything before I'm ready either. Yeah. Um, I, and I also want to make sure we have good uh, PPE like at our disposal right now. You know, if I have to go to the store, I'm using a fabric mask, but I'm not going to feel comfortable going to work wearing a fabric mask. Like, I'm going to want like an N95 or something similar. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. and those can be hard to come by, so. Exactly. And, I'm do- and I obviously don't feel that it would be right for me to- To use have- one when the health, the front lines need it, yeah. Right. So- Coming out of it, what do you think is going to change about our industry, the massage therapy industry? And if you want to comment on anything about aesthetics or nails or anything, any of that stuff too, what, sure. do you, what do you expect to see? Or I, I, industry as a whole, big picture, a little bit, whatever you want to say about it. Sure. Um, wow. There's, there's like what I think we're going to see and what I hope we do see. Start with what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think we're going to see sadly a lot of independent spa folks um closing their doors permanently. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of vacancies um so if somebody did want to look for a new location and they wanted to stay in this line of work, I'm guessing they're going to be able to find it's going to be a buyer's market as far as yeah storefronts go. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there will be a handful of people in our industry who, and I hesitate for a moment before I say this, who aren't going to treat COVID with the respect and the level of seriousness that it should be treated with. Mm -hmm. I think there will be a, a, a small segment of the industry that, I mean, we might end up seeing little hot spots that have to do with certain practitioners or certain locations, unfortunately. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a really, I think that's a real concern. Yeah. Not just, not just for massage, but just I'm across the board, massage, nails, hair, skincare across yeah. the board. Um, I think that, I think, but I do think it is an opportunity that a lot of people are uh, seeing and jumping on 
as a, an opportunity to improve their sanitation protocols yeah. and improve the level of knowledge they have about you know, <laughs> pathogens in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I do see a lot of that too. I think there's a lot of good that's going to come out of this as far as education and diligence goes. What about clients? Do you think the apprehension level or I've heard people say like, oh, we're the, the therapists, as soon as we get back, they're going to be in high demand and people are going to be knocking down the door. And I think that there's truth to both sides. Like there's going to be a group of people that are like, oh, I don't know. I'm not comfortable being in that close of contact with someone yet. And there's other people who are just, I mean, I've had clients reach out who are even like, are you back yet? Are you back yet? You know, I'm like, right. No, I know. I, same. I've had a few people contact me asking for house calls. Keep in mind, I've never done a, I've never done a pedicure in someone's house in my life. <laughs> it's also against Nevada. It's always been against the, law here in Nevada for Mm -hmm. a nail tech to do nail services in someone's home. So Mm -hmm. I don't do that. Um, But I've had people contact me and ask me about that, like more than one person. Um, Yeah. People asking me for massages, if I, if I'll come to their home and do a massage and, you know, I just say, I say, um, no, I'm closed right now. Sorry, but I'd love to see you when I'm able to work again. Yeah. It makes sense. So, um, and I, I kind of cut you off while well, you did the first part first. The uh, what do you hope to see out of our out of our industry? What I hope to see, yeah. and this is kind of going back to that whole assembly line model that um, some of the chains and the the bigger spas engage with. Yeah, right, exactly. Just having that, you know, ten minutes. As we all know, ten minutes between a appointments doesn't even mean 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes to get your person. Right. (laughs) So if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you have five minutes between clients. And when we're talking about using cleaning products that require a minimum of 10 minutes of wet contact on a non-porous surface Mm -hmm. to even be effective, not even just against like COVID, but against other germs Two, yeah. <laughs> um, knowing what we know now, maybe we were ignorant before, but knowing what we know now, it's a huge ethical misstep t- to keep that old model when we all now know what we should be doing from a sanitation and safety standpoint. Um, yeah. I, I hope, I hope that the types of businesses that we just talked about increase the breaks between clients, but I don't think that's going to happen in most cases because their volume, that's a volume-based business model. Same, yeah. It's the same thing. You know, I do custom pedicures and my people come to me because I don't rush through anything. I, I have always given myself an hour between clients so that I can be, you know, ethically ready for my next client. And um, I... Oh, I would love to see that change. I mean, there might be a certain amount of pressure, right? Like those, I mean, the chains here are always hiring, multiple locations. They're always looking for therapists. And I think there might be a little bit more demand coming from the client side and the potential employee side saying like, this stuff has to change or, you know, the clients won't be comfortable. The, so I think the the pressure might mount, as it were. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that for sure. Yeah. Cool. So, okay, before I let you go, I feel like given everything you do, I need to ask you about feet. What? <laughs> Some people have very strong feelings about feet in general. Yeah, this is true, and I yeah. hear about all of their strong yeah, feelings. Sure you so, uh, if you could get, well, it's given that you probably have seen more feet up close and personal than e- even the, the average massage therapist, like what what are people getting wrong about their foot care, and what do you think people ought to be doing, especially during this time when they can't come see you? What are the right things to, for people to do with their feet? So. I get so many questions, even during the shutdown, like over the last month and a half, I've had people who I haven't talked to for like, you know, a year texting me out of the blue. Oh my God, what do I do about 
these calluses or <laughs> this dry skin on my feet. Um, and I am always happy to text back with my recommendations. So a couple things. So dry skin on the feet is definitely like at the top of the list, right? So a couple easy things that people can do at home is um, you don't have to do anything fancy or exotic to smooth out your feet. Honestly, between pedicures, one of the best things you can do is get yourself one of those double-sided, like the thick wider um, foam core nail files. It's not a pedicure file, foot file. It's a nail file. And it's going to be a 100 slash 180 grit. Okay. You can get them online. Amazon has them. Sure. So on dry skin. So before you take your morning shower, you're going to take that, usually start with the 100 grit side because it's, you know, coarser. Use that on any calluses or dry areas on the bottom of your foot. And then if you want to smooth it out a little bit more after that side, flip it over and use the 180 on it. Dry skin only. And you will be amazed with the difference that that will make as a little like, you know, tied you over between pedicures. And then the second tip I have is I wish people would just get more in the habit of moisturizing their feet before they put socks on. I don't care if it's in the morning after their shower or at night before they go to bed, but just putting a rich moisturizer, even if all you have right now is hand cream, because we're all washing our hands yeah. three times a day, right? So even if all you have is a thicker hand cream, use that and just slather it on, use a lot of it and put socks on for the day or the night and you'll, you'll thank me later. Yeah. I'm like, oh, can I do it? That sounds, it sounds like such a goopy feeling. <laughs> I don't know if I want the, al- the alternative would be to do like a spot treatment with something thicker, like, um, like a shea butter or a cocoa butter stick or something like that. And just yeah. put it on the super dry areas. So it doesn't feel like your whole foot is like you, sliding around. Can you around. want to use cocoa butter to just use as the foot cream? Yeah, that, you yeah. Ha- it'll it'll need to to use it as a massage lubricant. It it might need to melt a little bit once it hits the skin. So if someone oh. has cold feet, it might be a little bit. Oh like, no, I just meant for people to use personally. Oh yeah, cocoa yeah. butter. Like you can get it in a stick, like a super convenient oh. stick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it smells good too. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, and now it just occurred to me that there's one other thing you said about your store that you have curiosities. Yeah, so my curiosity. <laughs> my decor is really interesting and unique and um if I do say so myself. Yeah. And I've got like I've got some interesting books about um skulls and like vintage anatomical figures around the place oh. and like some um you know like butterflies in real butterflies in display cases and things oh, like cool. that. So yeah, it's a little bit curiosity shop. Yeah. Okay. Neat. Thanks. Well, Andrea from Nevada, by way of New York, uh, with Fetish Spa Parlor. Thanks so much for being on the show. We'll chat for a few for a few more minutes after this. But thanks for being on the Massage Hodge podcast. I appreciate it so much. Thanks, Nick. This was so much fun. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll we'll say goodbye to our listeners. Bye. Bye.